Okay, this is going to be a very non-visual look at investigating limiting factors in photosynthesis. I have a few other videos that talk about factors that affect photosynthesis, and even for the higher level details, I've tried to illustrate uh, what limiting factors are and how one factor can actually be the only one that's limiting the actual rate of a particular reaction. And this applies to all kinds of experiments and reactions, not just photosynthesis. But uh, in this particular video, I'm just going to give you some practical practical advice about investigating actual limiting factors. So for photosynthesis, you should know you've got light, uh, you've got temperature, and you've got carbon dioxide concentration, which are three pretty standard ways uh, to test the effect of a factor on photosynthesis. So a limiting factor would be the one factor that is really controlling the rate of photosynthesis. You might think it's other factors, but there's really only one at any given time that's the kind of slowest step in the entire process. So when you're designing an experiment, you wanna choose one limiting factor as your IV, your independent variable. You should keep the range uh, good so that it starts from the lowest possible level to where it's no longer the limiting factor. So you would increase it up until it's possibly something else that's messing with it. So you wanna make sure you've done your research research to choose an appropriate range. You want to figure out an accurate way to actually measure the rate of photosynthesis. You want to measure either the products, the production of the products, or the uptake of the reactants. So for example, in photosynthesis, oxygen is one of the main products. So if you can measure the oxygen production over time, that can help you to calculate the rate. You have to also make sure to keep your controlled variables constant. These are standard rules for any kind of scientific investigation. You only change one variable and everything else stays constant. So here's a quick chart to take a look at. Depending on what factor you're actually investigating, here you, you're given a method of how to actually vary that factor, a suggested range. I'm not going to, going to explain all the reasons for these particular ranges, just whatever is suggested right here is probably a good place to start and you can be sure that you know at the lowest numbers at the lowest numbers you're pretty much having no effect on photosynthesis and then when you go all the way up you're maxing out whatever this particular factor would be having on photosynthesis and towards the top levels here it's probably something else that will be limiting photosynthesis and then also some guidelines for how you would actually control that factor so say you're doing an experiment on temperature and temperature is your independent variable well this is how you would vary the temperature for something like pond weed putting on a hot plate and varying the temperature and then over here you would keep these other two things light intensity and carbon dioxide concentration the same by keeping the light distance the same and adding lots of sodium hydrogen carbonate to make sure there's plenty of carbon dioxide concentration because that is not the one that you're investigating when you're looking particularly at temperature so yeah a few other points here Let's see, what can I point out? For carbon dioxide concentration, you can add sodium hydrogen carbonate to increase the carbon dioxide concentration. If you want to really get water with no carbon dioxide in it, a quick tip is to just boil it. If you boil the water, you're technically, you can, you're removing any of the dissolved carbon dioxide. If you're doing an experiment where... Uh, you're using a water as the medium for your particular photosynthesizing organism. So let's look at some of these limiting factors. In another video, I've actually drawn out the details of the light-dependent reactions and also the light-independent reactions like the, car the Calvin cycle. So you can actually see how these three factors are specifically limiting particular parts of those metabolic reactions. But we're just gonna list them out here and then I'll try to reference that particular video so you can take a look if you wanna go one step further with all of that. So let's look at light first. At low light intensities, you're really limiting the rate of photolysis. And so if you're limiting photolysis, Photolysis, which is the process of breaking down or splitting water, you're splitting water into oxygen and hydrogen. Well, if you slow down this particular reaction called photolysis, that's exactly where your oxygen is coming from. So your oxygen production is going to be limited. And as you increase the light intensities, you're going to basically allow for more photolysis to actually happen and therefore more ATP is made. And then that ATP can be used to convert the carbon dioxide to glucose. At really high light intensities, one of these other factors is going to become the limiting factor. The next two factors are a little bit more involved. So for carbon dioxide concentration, if you think about the 
Kelvin cycle, its primary goal is to turn carbon dioxide into glucose. So if you don't have enough carbon dioxide, there's no conversion to glucose. Carbon dioxide is going to be catalyzed in this conversion by this famous enzyme called Rubisco or ribulose bisphosphate carboxylase. And if there's not a lot of that enzyme interaction going on, then the Calvin cycle doesn't run. So how does that affect oxygen then, if I'm measuring oxygen as the output? Well, if the Calvin cycle doesn't run, then a bunch of the things that are supposed to be used in the Calvin cycle don't get used. And as a result of that, the reactions that are happening in the light dependent reactions end up slowing down. And so you don't get oxygen you go back to this idea of photolysis, those initial reactions get stopped and therefore oxygen is not going to be produced as a result. So that's a little bit more involved. So check out the other video to really look at the particular enzymes that are going on here. So here uh, in a small diagram, you can see carbon dioxide needs to be uh, fed into here to combine with Rubisco. Rubisco is the enzyme that's going to catalyze the joining up of this particular molecule with this one right here. And then when they actually get joined together, that's going to allow the Calvin cycle to proceed. If this part does not happen, then ATP doesn't get used, NADPH don't get used, and all of these molecules that came from the light dependent reactions in the beginning get completely backed up and so nothing gets produced, everything slows down. At really high carbon dioxide concentrations, some other factor starts to limit the entire thing. The temperature limiting factor is actually related to this one. It's the same step actually, it's right over here, because temperature affects how quickly enzymes will be able to collide uh, with their actual substrate. So at low temperatures, this reaction, it's almost like having limited carbon dioxide. At low temperatures, uh, there's very few interactions that are going on. The molecules are not colliding, the enzymes are not colliding, so Rubisco starts doing its job a little bit less. If you understand something about enzymes, then you know that the higher you increase their temperature, uh, the greater the collisions are, and therefore the faster the reaction rate. Up until you get to a really relatively high temperature for an enzyme, and then denaturing is going to start. And then that changes the shape of the enzyme. In this case, we'll keep talking about the famous Rubisco. When the shape of this enzyme changes shape, then it's not going to be able to do its job either. So at extremely high temperatures, this is going to shut down altogether as well too. But if you keep on increasing the temperature, you're going to end up with increasing rates of oxygen production, even above uh, 30 degrees, as mentioned here, even above 30 degrees, uh, it's still going to happen, but not as effective, and then it's gonna go much higher than that, and then if it goes any higher than that, you could possibly reach the point of denaturing. So a quick look at the limiting factors and then some of the practical advice that goes into actually setting up a photosynthesis experiment. Good one to do for a regular IA or for an extended essay, Again, when you come around with these particular types of experiments, they can be designed very simply and they can also you know, be designed in a complex manner. And you're really aiming to increase the complexity uh, because you already know from literature values and what's in your textbook and most of the things that you look up, how these actual factors are going to affect photosynthesis. So you really want to focus on uh, designing a strong experiment that can collect really clear data that you can compare and then hopefully be able to reinforce our understandings of photosynthesis and how it happens.